The following is a presentation of the Matt Talk Podcast Network. Welcome to On the Mat. I am Kyle Klingman of the National Wrestling Hall of Fame Dan Gable Museum. Joined by a man who's buzzing because he is the pride of the Yankees, Andy Hamilton of TrackWrestling.com. Before we get into the wrestling, you just have to get props to what your Yankees are doing right now. Pretty on incredible. fire, Kyle. You like it, They're don't on you? fire. Feels yeah. good, huh? Feels great. I know it does. It, it yeah. does. Every <laughs> night, every night, when it rolls around about 6.05, can't wait. So we're dropping in some Bart Scott lines yeah, and I know, undertones. But drop in your Menard story. Didn't you watch it at a Menards? And oh, so a- uh, Sunday when they're down against the Indians, um, down four zero, and I was uh, having to get some stuff done. I was out at Menards um, getting a rototiller, and ninth inning they're making. A, they actually scored three in the the bottom of the eighth to make it four three. They got a rally going in the ninth, and uh, I had to sit down in like the the. Uh, patio furniture section of Menards and I watched uh, Glaber Torres hit a three-run walk-off and I was making a little (laughs) bit of a scene in Menards. (laughs) That's great. But uh, it's an awesome team. They're so much fun right now. A lot of homegrown talent. You know, I can't ever remember an in-season. Well, there's never been an in-season run like this for them in my lifetime. Last time they won 17 of 18 in-season was 1953. Man. Fun times and fun times for the sport of wrestling right now. We have a couple great stories for interviews we're going to have on the show today. Tony Ramos is going to be on the program. He won the U.S. Open at 57 kilos. And then Ben Provisor, we're going to get into his story. What an incredible run he had at the Pan American Championships. He's a Greco-Roman guy, gets a bronze medal there. And then he wins a gold in freestyle filling in for Jaden Cox. So we're going to break down that story. I'm glad you suggested getting that interview because I think it's going to be fantastic talking about him. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I tweeted this out uh, the other day after the Pan Am Championships. I think he outscored his opponents like 32-0 to zero while filling in for Jaden. Jaden was sick, so he fills in at the last minute. And I joked that uh, if you're not feeling well and you need to Call in somebody to take your place at work. Ben Provisor is the guy you <laughs> He's call. The guy you want. And what a gamer to do that! I guess. Yeah. Why, why not? Yeah, it was. I, you know, watching him, it was like he was wrestling Greco out there. I don't remember anybody really touching his legs. I don't remember him touching anybody's legs. He was snapping people down, hitting go behinds, gut wrenches, pushing people out of bounds. But uh, yeah, it'd be a lot of fun to talk to Ben about uh, how this all this came together and, and just some of his thoughts and. You know what's going on within his training right now as he prepares for the Greco-Roman World Team Trials. It's that time of year with international flavor, and I geek out for the World Team Trials. This is really one of the quintessential events that that gets me excited. It's a different format this year, but still, the, what's going to happen in Rochester with the tournament that goes on? I just think there's going to be so many fun storylines with guys that we are familiar with that I want to see who gets to that final spot. I know we talked about different weight classes, and I said 125 and a half pounds was my favorite, or 57 kilos for you. Uh, you said all 10 of them are your favorites, but as far as just maybe some of the guys, individuals that uh, excited to see, I tell you, the, the heavyweight class continues to be intriguing. It's uh, I never thought I would say that, but with Gable Stevenson going juniors and going seniors, from what I hear, someone said that that might not be allowable. I think it is. I think he can do both. But I'm excited to see what happens there. Hopefully Jake Varner continues to compete. You have Adam Kuhn. So super heavyweight's a good storyline right now. Nick Wazdowski sitting in Final X too. So Yeah. Yeah, that's uh it's pretty pretty compelling. You know, Don Bradley, there are a lot of guys in there that uh, seem to be pretty evenly matched. So we'll be really fascinating to see who comes out of Rochester and who's waiting for, for Quiz. Well, and we're in a phase right now that we haven't seen in 20 years. 1996 Olympic Games was the last time we had 10 contested weight classes. Now we're at 10. I'm really excited about this opportunity because it's going to spread things a little bit more thin, but a lot of those great guys are getting opportunities, and I think we're going to be able to see that at the World Team Trials. Really excited about giving those guys hope. Really disappointed that we don't have 10 at the Olympic Games, but take what we can get at the World Championships. Yeah, it, 
the next two years are going to be uh, – certainly next year is going to be really interesting to see what some of these guys do as they prepare for 2020. Uh, you know, Do they begin their ascent to another weight class or descent back down to another weight class? Uh, I think – one of the things that's that's uh, you know really neat to me is I think we have depth in the United States now at ten weight classes that that maybe exceeds the depth that we had at what was it seven weight classes ten years ago. Yeah, you look at where where we were about ten years ago, and and guys are going off to MMA. We got guys that uh, multi time NCAA champions uh, that aren't really even given. Uh, international wrestling much of a shot or or guys that are making olympic teams and are going off and into the octagon and and now we've changed that around the developmental system is so much stronger uh the living the dream metal fund has helped i think uh, wrestling wrestlers have found ways to monetize uh their careers so they're not just struggling to get by they're finding endorsement deals you know guys aren't having to coach to make ends meet, you know, so now guys can train full time. I think uh, we're in a lot healthier spot in the United States from free, a men's freestyle standpoint than uh, not just the talent that's hitting the mat, but how we're able to retain that talent and keep guys. Uh, heck, you think 2011 when Jordan Burroughs won his first world title, like rem- remember the, the thoughts that people like the topic conversation was, well, how long is he going to keep wrestling before he goes off and fights, right? <laughs> yeah. And and like yeah. here the last four or five years, that's not even been a question. Yeah. He's he's stuck with it and has been the the guy. And I know he's wanting to say that it's Kyle Snyder and it looks like it's going to be. But I tell you what, what Jordan Burroughs is doing and his star power, it's as strong as ever. And I think it's compelling that he overcame a, a really bad Olympic Games where he got tech falled on the backside and he admits those things and talks about how he's grown from that. But... Jordan Burroughs is the man. This guy is incredible, and I think it's going to be really fun to see how he does through this cycle because he'll be 30 years old coming up. I think on July 8th I saw it's going to be interesting to see if when he goes in his early 30s phase how he keeps up, but he's he's picking up new things. He looks as good as ever. It, yeah. It's really incredible. And that's been the thing that uh, has been a hallmark of his career. I mean, you think back to his first world title, and he's winning basically with just takedowns, takedowns and pushouts, maybe. And and then 2012, he's developing some you know transitions into turns on top, and he's just added more and more to his game. I think back to uh, uh, one year in there, I can't remember. I think it might have been 2015 or so, where uh, you know you hear talk about how he's going out and working out with the Greco guys out in Colorado Springs to work on gut wrench defense. And, uh, you know, I think of an instance, uh, one year at the, the world team trials where Dake had a, you know, Dake who was tougher than nails on top, had a gut wrench locked up in the middle of the mat and couldn't do anything with him. So that has been to me, the biggest key in Jordan Burroughs's development is that, you know, everybody in the world's been gunning for him since 2011, since he came onto the scene. They've he's he's been in the crosshairs, and yet, uh, you know, he got taken down in 2014, where he got the bronze. Uh, you know, you mentioned what happened to him in 2016, and and I think there were some uh, some odd circumstances that played out in Rio with just the uh, stoppages of that match against Godoyev with with all the blood time stoppages yeah. and. And he was just never able to to really get into a rhythm in that match. Uh, and then, you know, the match that he lost in the, in the repechage, I kind of throw that one away just because that wasn't, uh, you know, that Jordan put a lot of eggs in the Rio basket. And, you know, when they shattered uh, in uh, that, that match against Godoy of, uh, you know, we, we didn't see the Jordan Burroughs were accustomed to seeing on the backside. So, uh, but but uh, tremendous testament to him to come back in 2017, and uh, you, you just don't uh, you don't see that very often that a, that a guy uh, goes through that uh, that kind of situation. He was really questioning a lot of things, uh, but yet he gets back up on the horse and goes and finds a way to win another world title. What was the great quote we liked from Coleman Scott um, a few months ago when we had him on? I think he said that 
when he was the world team coach that Jordan Burroughs asked 80% of the questions of everyone on the team. I think we both picked up on that, that that really was a testament that here's a guy that's the most successful guy on the ladder, and he's asking the most questions from Coleman Scott and just trying to grow and learn, and that's why he's winning multiple titles is he's not – resting on his laurels he's not saying i'm this multi-time gold medal i have five of these that i have to stop now and i've arrived he's, he's looking for those small details and coleman scott certainly picked up on that too well that was one of the probably my biggest takeaway from being around jordan last year at the uh, world team training camp out in colorado springs uh right after the fourth of july uh in there on like a friday morning the the last day of camp uh, Jordan and, and Zane Rutherford are kind of rolling around a little bit and uh, working on some front headlock positions. And Jordan is all ears w- with Coleman Scott teaching some, you know, breaking down some technique in that position. Coleman Scott and Mike DeRoe. And here's the the most credentialed guy in that room. And there are world champions and uh, Olympic champions and all sorts of NCAA champions in that room. And yet... Uh, he was so inquisitive about certain certain positions that they were working through. I thought that was really neat. I thought that that was uh, really telling about how, not only how he's gotten to this point, but how he's been able to stay on top for uh, you know now five World and Olympic titles. To your point earlier, though, as we look to the future, and it's <laughs> it's easier for us to do because we're inquisitive, and and it's easier for the athletes to say, let's just live in the now. But for us to look at 2020, there's just a lot of good wrestlers that are going to have to make decisions. Yeah, James Green, Joe Cologne, Jaden Cox. I mean, just go through all the names of these people that we're excited to see right now. We've seen these great matches. Nashawn Garrett and Joe Cologne had a, a great shootout match, but what are they going to do? What's I, Kyle Digg going to do? What's Yeah, that's the big one. You brought that one up. Yeah. I think he's going to go back down a weight class, but... Maybe not. I mean, it's uh, you're going to have to meet Jaden Cox probably at that weight class unless he goes up to, to face Kyle Snyder, which I don't think he's going to do. So just a lot of question marks that it's disappointing that we have to put these guys in a position to make that, that decision. It's good they have the non-Olympic world championships, that, that you have that outlet, but let these best guys compete at the Olympic Games. I, I don't I don't know the politics and what why it's minimized that much. But we need 10. We need to push for 10, and I hope we get there. Yeah, I I think we have a lot of work to do uh, as a sport to get back to that point. But I think there have been a lot of positive steps towards, uh, you know, there have been a lot of positive steps since 2013, since, uh, you know, wrestling was put on the Olympic chopping yeah. block. You know, the sport has come light years in terms of the entertainment. Uh, I, I credit United World Wrestling for putting together a rules package that uh, has, has promoted high action, high entertainment, high scoring. Um, that's, that's been great. I think they've done a, uh, I think they've done a really good job. United world wrestling has a promotion here in the last couple of years, the video crew that I get a chance to spend, uh, you know, several weeks with last summer at uh, all four world championships, you know that crew's top notch. They've been doing a lot of great job, a, a lot of great work on social media. So the profile of some of these uh, international stars has been raised, and uh, I, I think we're in a better position. You know, are there things that we can do to continue moving in that direction? Absolutely, I think we can do a, an even better job of promoting the top stars around the world. Uh, but. Uh, Certainly, wrestling is in a much, much better position than it was five years ago. And yeah, and it's, it's not as corrupt either. I think that's the big thing, too. Is And that's been a storyline that I've seen and we've talked a little bit about is that you just don't see the blatant hose jobs in the sport anymore. I mean, just some of the blatant carry colots where you're re wrestling matches and just going behind and having the politics. I don't see it as much. I think it's probably still there because you, you can't change things overnight. It's a, a progression. But I just don't see the, the fits of anger with the coaches coming on the mats and just saying, hey, you got me on this. And part of that's the rules, though, too. I mean, we, the ball draw is something we've brought up numerous times. But when you have a rules package that is conducive to action and it's easier to follow, you're not going to have those hose jobs as much. 
there's some instances where uh, you know the rules get a little bit muddied a little bit. I mean, I think about uh, the Dake Daringer yeah. match. I mean, there's just some situations in that that get a little bit confusing. You know, right? Where where who's who. Who exposed who here? Yeah. You know, who, whose action led to the other one exposing? Stuff like that that's uh, a little bit uh, confusing maybe for – heck, if it's if, – if wrestling people are confused, how about the, the non-wrestling people, right? Yeah. And, and so how do you – how do you iron that out? I, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but um, – Initiate – how who initiated the exactly. action. Exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. But um, it's it's come so far since 2013, you know, the, the ball draw was – you know that era was such a dark era for the sport. Yeah. And man, you wonder why it took so long to get away from that. Right? I mean, that was so bad for so long and it's it's no wonder we wound up in the position that we were in as a sport because of some of the things that were going on, the action on the mat, the lack of action off the mat in terms of uh being really plugged in to what what the IOC is thinking. Um you know, not being vigilant on some of the things uh, from an administrative standpoint that they needed to be, uh, but um, seems to me that that things are heading in a much better direction now. But I think you'd agree in hindsight that when that happened in 2013, there's shock. But in a way, you're saying in the back of your head, we deserve this. Yeah, because there were a lot of things we did wrong, and it was a lot of horrible things in the sport that only got cleaned up because of this happening and i think rich bender said this is the best thing that could have happened to us rich bender being the executive director of usa wrestling i think he said this is the best possible thing that could happen to wrestling because it really solidified what we needed to do to take it into the future and we have good leadership right now with uh with lalovic and i think he's doing a good job and all the things you mentioned the social media and you see them on twitter and you see facebook it's just out there, there there's more out there on the international wrestling than there's ever been before on the highlight packages. It's fantastic. Yeah, it sounds like they're more plugged in with the IOC than before, too. You think back to one of, one of the things to me that was just mind-boggling uh, about 2013 when it, when it got dropped is you know having those meetings. What, what the IOC had meetings that uh, were, were, what, like 15 miles from, from the FILA? FILA, what, you know, United World Wrestling, known as FILA at the time, yeah. from the FILA headquarters... And yet, there's no rep- wrestling representation there. I mean, that was one of the things. Bryce Miller, uh, now a columnist in San Diego, my one of my former colleagues at the Des Moines Register. Him and I spent, uh, you know, from the time wrestling was dropped in 2013 until the time that it was brought back. I think it was like maybe a 26 week period, 26, 27 weeks. We did a 26 part series, kind of diving into how did wrestling wind up in this position? How does it wind up back in the Olympics? And and that was a pretty enlightening process. And that was one of the things to me that really stood out was the fact that they were, there was no wrestling representation at that meeting. What kind of image does that portray to the, the IOC about how much you care, right? About, yeah. about being in, in the Olympics. But uh, fortunately, a lot of people came to the rescue. A lot of people stepped up and uh, saved Olympic wrestling at that point, and I, I hope that uh, we don't ever take things for granted like that again. I hope that uh, we keep our foot on the pedal trying to improve wrestling around the globe. We're going to bring Tony Ramos in here. Just give us a quick minute here. You covered the University of Iowa wrestling program. That was your full-time job. Tell us what you remember about Tony Ramos before we bring him on the line. One of the best guys to deal with from a media standpoint because he would always take the questions, good, bad, indifferent. He would always stand up and answer the questions. Uh, you know, whether he lost to Logan Steber in the NCAA finals in controversial fashion in Des Moines or whether he won the title in Oklahoma City the following year, good, bad, indifferent, he was always there. Uh, so, so I really appreciated that. Um, you know, it's easy to stand up and answer the questions when you're winning, NC, you know, an NCAA title. It's not so easy when uh, when you're seven minutes away from becoming a national champion and, and uh, you know, you get your dreams crushed. So always give him a lot of credit for that, and he's always been candid. Uh, feel like he's always given you uh, an honest answer of what he feels. Um, but, uh, yeah, just been, you know, when he was with the Hawkeyes, he was a delight to deal with. And, uh 
It's, uh, you know, you, you might not always agree with what he says, but you always know that uh, you're going to get an answer from him that uh, is genuine and how he feels. Our first guest, Tony Ramos, two-time world team member. He made the freestyle world team at 57 kilos, or as I like to call it, 125 and a half pounds. Andy, NCAA champion for the University of Iowa at 133 pounds in 2014. Tony Ramos, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you guys? We're doing good. How's things going down in North Carolina? They're going good. Uh, just getting ready for, you know, that second part of the World Team Trials process. How do, what do you like uh, about the process? This You've been through this a lot. Do you like the new process that you have to go through? Uh, not really. Um, you know, they just added a few more steps, kind of complicated it from the outside perspective. You know, I got people asking me all the time, what's the event or how does this work? How does that work? But, you know, it is what it is and that's what we got to go with right now. Do you have a good explanation that you've gotten down to on how to describe the process? <laughs> uh, not really. I just tell them it's actually pretty easy. It's th- broken up into three events, but where they get really confused is who qualifies to what and why is this guy there? Or someone's sitting out here and not there. And, you know, this uh, new true third situation that they're talking about so you know i could see how it's confusing to a fan so you're in a unique spot in that you are sitting out of the world team trials that gets you to final x how do you prepare how do you train for that because you are one of the few that's in the middle ground you have someone that's going to come to you but if you win that you have to go to someone else how are you training for that is it different how are you viewing the uh the competition side of it um you know i'm just preparing uh like I would be, you know, any other tournament doing kind of the same things. Um, you know, I think the biggest focus now, and I think kind of where I was off a little bit the last two years is uh, I'm just focusing on getting myself better and, you know, better in my wrestling um, instead of, you know, who might come through the tournament or this or that, you know. I think we have a pretty good idea who we're probably going to see or options we could see, and uh, I'm not too focused on what they do. I'm just aware of what they do, and, it was really focused on my wrestling. And the biggest thing is, uh, like you said, I'm sitting out, but I still got to weigh in that first day um, and then sit around and do nothing. So, you know, just kind of that process of um, that first day, you know, what what's the plan? What are we going to do? Um, and then getting ready, you know, for day number two. Is that hard to sit out the finals like that? Because a big part of that in coming through the mini tournament is you get warmed up, you get your body going. How do you make sure that you're adapted and you've had that hard blow to make sure you're ready for the, the first match of that best of three? Uh, I think, you, you know, you got to get something in early. You know, it, it can be, I think it could be an advantage. And I think it could be a disadvantage too. Like you said, you know, uh, a one day tournament, you really don't get too sore. Um, if you just push right through, but now that it's two days, you know, these guys coming through are going to be a little sore, you know, going into day number two, where I'll be pretty fresh. But, um, you know, back when it was the one day process, you know, some of these guys coming through that mini tournament kind of get momentum. They get the ball rolling, you know, they're warmed up they're they get in their stride and you're freaking jumping into, uh, someone who's got a lot going behind them. Was it automatic that you were going to compete this year? So after last year in Lincoln, did you have to make a decision that you were going to compete in this next freestyle cycle? Uh, yeah, I knew I was competing right away. Uh, you know, the biggest thing was about weight. Uh, you know, it was automatic at first that I was going 61, and then uh, kind of changed near the end. Um, you know, it was just what was best for me and what was best for me going forward with uh, on the world stage. Does that get harder and harder to make that weight class? Uh, I wouldn't say harder and harder. I think it's getting easier, um, especially now that it's a day on lane. you got to be more strict with your diet and preparation and, um, you know, kind of how you go about making the weight. So, you know, the, the hard part for would be these multiple lanes in a row right now, you know, making weight every three weeks. So, you know, there's really no time to let up. i got to be pretty strict. Uh, consistently, but at the same time, that's kind of helping me um, feel better and train at a lower weight. So, you know, it's it goes hand in hand both ways. You have a unique perspective in that you competed for the University of Iowa. Now you're at North Carolina. Compare and contrast the different cultures. How different are they? 
Uh, yeah. yeah. I don't know if they're really different on this, this aspect of, you know, wanting to win, wanting to be the best. Um, you know, striving for a world with McDonald's, things like that. I think it's, you know, a different approach of um, how you, I wouldn't say treat the guys, but um, a different approach of how you interact with the athletes, you know, staff, um, how we interact with each other. That's a, that's a little bit different. Uh, I would say it's a little more laid back and lenient, which is nice, you know, um, you're not always kind of looking over your shoulder if you're doing the right things or, you know, what's, what's going to, um, you know, what are you going to get questioned about here or there? Do you get recognized in Chapel Hill like you would in Iowa city? Uh, yeah, you still get recognized here. I mean, yeah. you know, NC state Raleigh area is right down the road. People know wrestling, um, people stop. They want to talk, chit chat at the mall. Um, it, it's not as consistently as in Iowa, um, but you know, it's, it's starting to grow here. Uh, you know, NC state just took fourth this year. Um, we were in the top 20, the, the, if you look at the fan base ranking or whatever it is, you know, I think NC state was up there in that top 10 and, you know, we're hoping to make a push here in the next couple of years to get into that area. Um, so it, it's definitely growing, uh, youth wrestling is growing. So it's an exciting time here. Tony, when when I think of guys that uh, in the sport of wrestling who are good at promotion, you're certainly one of them. You know, you you've wrestled and you've coached at the NCAA championships. There's twenty thousand people in the stands there. You go to the U.S. Open. There's maybe two thousand people in the stands there. How do we, as a wrestling community, grow the following for international wrestling within the United States? Uh, that is something we've talked about for a long time now. It is very hard. I think it's getting better. Um, I think the biggest thing is, um, and it's really not putting a blame on anyone, but the media and, you know, all these different outlets. Um, I think they put a much bigger emphasis on NCA and these college level athletes, um, and really promote these high school kids coming up into college than they do promoting these college guys going into the international scene or the international scene. And uh, the perspective of the younger culture, the wrestling culture in the U.S. is, you know, the NCAA championships is the thing. And then there's some of these guys that just go on after and keep wrestling internationally. One of the ways you promoted the sport was your famous stare down when you were a <clears throat> Hawkeye. We don't see that as much anymore. Is that something you consciously got away from? Uh, I I don't know if it's consciously, um, you know, there's just time to make a switch, you know, in a different element or a different thing and uh, just kind of go from there. Wrestling date and fix in the finals. There's this youth movement. A lot of these young guys get into the, the finals of, of a lot of major tournaments right now. When you go against a, a youthful guy like that, how do you process that being the, the veteran right now, knowing you got a true freshman trying to take your spot? How do you process that, that mentally when you're in the finals against a guy like that? Um, you know, you can't treat it any different. These young kids are getting tough. You know, I talk about it consistently about how these younger kids are ready to go right away. You know, they don't need a red shirt just on the college level, um, being a college coach. And that, co- I think that comes from, you know, these great clubs that we have all over, you know, the country, uh, have these high level college coaches or very high level coaches, coaching from a younger age. So they're prepared and they're, they're getting better quicker. Um, so, you know, it, it, I'm not surprised these young guys are competing. Um, but at the same time, you know, you have to go out there and treat it like a, a regular match. You know, it's just another opponent and you got to wrestle. Coleman Scott, the head wrestling coach at North Carolina, <clears throat> who you work with daily, seems like a unique guy and that he really has built a, a good program here, but he's a young guy too, getting to that college level. What's, uh, what's unique about Coleman Scott and what does he bring to your career that, uh, is getting you to another level? Uh, it's a different perspective. It's a different eye looking at me. You know, it's that I wouldn't say it's really the whole Oklahoma State kind of concept of wrestling because, you know, we mesh well together and we do, like I said, our philosophies and our mindsets are pretty much the same. It's just a different way or a different perspective of looking at it and kind of getting me to see it a different way um, than just the way that I was used to looking at things. Um, so that's kind of where he's helping grow. Um, but at the same time, I think we're all growing together, being such a young staff. 
and uh, you know learn how to do things to get better as a group. Tony, it seems like public perception of Tony Ramos has changed here in the last couple of years. A lot of people that might not have been Ramos fans are have come around and become Ramos fans. We've we've seen it on social media, just different things that have been said. Do you feel like you have changed at all, or are people just now seeing a side of you that that's been there all along? Um, you know, I think it literally was on me a, a conscious effort. Um, but at the same time, you know, like you said, that side was always there. It was just more or less um, kind of what was being displayed or kind of how I was promoting myself. You know, I knew the area, the location I was in, and what was going to work best with those fans. And then when I made that switch, that transition, you know, I kind of knew what was going to work or how to grow that following, you know, in a different area um, to kind of keep that fan base up. Because when I did go from Iowa to North Carolina, you know, I probably was going to lose some of those Iowa fans or those people. Kenny Monday is another guy that I want to bring up as far as just what he brings. He's a bigger guy, but what does he add to your arsenal? How does he develop you? Uh, You know, Kenny was pretty fast, pretty explosive wrestler. Um, You know, there's some little things that he was kind of trying to help me work on. Uh, just with my motion and coming off my hands to kind of some of the things he did that made him very successful. Um, you know, he's a great freestyle mind. He's Olympic champ, like you said, um, been world championships, been around some of the top guys. So, you know, he's got some tricks that, uh, that work and that he's, you know, trying to help me out and remind me of some freestyle positions. Those are two former Cowboys. You're a former Hawkeye. Do you ever talk about the rivalry? <laughs> Not much. I mean, when they do wrestle, we talk about it a little bit, but, you know, we're all Tar Heels now, and we all want to make that program better, and that's kind of where our focus is. So you haven't sat around and watched the uh, the Jordan Oliver match where everyone's going nuts at, Car- nuts at Carver and, and rehash those days? No, not at all. Was that, I mean, go back to that moment, because that was a, a really big moment for you, and a, a lot of people recognize you for that dual meet. How, how awesome was that to pull out a win like that in a, a great environment? Uh, it was really cool. I mean, it just went sh- to, pr- to, my, to show myself, and I think a lot of young kids coming through the sport that, you know, no matter how much of an underdog you are or how many people think you can't win or it's not impossible, you know, you can do whatever you want if your mind's in the right place and if you believe in yourself and you believe in your training and your coaches and, you know, all those things that add up. You're a theater arts major. How can we apply what you learned in theater to the sport of wrestling? Um, you know, it, it taught me a lot of things, just like interviewing Wally, and, um, you know, being your present or your charisma, you know, in front of the camera, things like that. But also at the same time, you know, being on stage, you have to be able to react to uh, different situations, just like on a wrestling mat. If things aren't going the right way, um, you got to, find a way to react and make it go the right way um you know and sometimes that happens in theater if you forget your lines uh you better correct it really fast to make sure it looks like it was a smooth transition when was the last time you were on stage oh probably back in college really uh unless you consider the u.s open or those tournaments well it, we would stage. consider that i guess more of a performance art and uh and actually having a script <clears throat> where you have to to uh, perform in front of an audience that's expecting something. But uh, I I didn't know if that was something you were going to parlay after (laughs) wrestling, if you wanted to uh, continue with the theater arts avenue. Um, You know, I really haven't something I thought about much. Um, I just kind of use it to, uh, you know, grow my brand, grow my personality, grow my program, um, and really focus, you know, on what type of aspects, uh, the one thing I worked on a lot in theater was like the lighting design, things like that. You know, how how can I bring a show to our program when we're putting out events, you know, that's going to excite the fans, things like that. You know, that's really where I use most of that theater stuff. What kind of movies you hitting up when you want to watch movies? Do you have any go-tos? Right now, the greatest showman. Is that good? That's one of my go-tos It's really good. I like it a lot. Uh, You know, there's a lot of really good, underlying messages some pretty good quotes um you know a guy whose back was against the wall he found a way to make it work and accomplish his dreams um 
but also at the same time, even when he was at the highest, uh, he wasn't satisfied. It's not that he wasn't satisfied. He wasn't happy. You know, he realized that being at the top or having all the money in the world isn't always the greatest thing. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of good things in that movie. You guys are coming off a 20th place finish at the NCAA championships. A couple of Americans. You got some good young guys getting ready to step in the lineup. You've recruited well. Uh, a lot of nationally ranked guys committed to North Carolina are signed and on their way. What's the next step for the Tar Heels? Getting in that top five, bringing home a trophy. Um, you know, we got to keep recruiting well. We got to keep that pipeline that I got going in Illinois. Um, you know, it's one of the best states for wrestling. And we got to keep snagging the top talent we can out of there, along with, you know, everywhere else in the country. Uh, one of the nice things is, you know, our coaching staff has a lot of relationships, not just in one area, but everywhere. So we're kind of getting looks from, you know, north, south, east, west, midwest. Uh, and you can see that in our recruiting classes. You know, there's kids coming from all over California, Florida, Illinois. Uh, you know, we got a kid from Georgia. that We're finding all these kids and we're developing them. And they're believing in what we preach and what we talk about, and uh, it, it's it's fun. I'm excited. So that's next is getting what trophy and putting some more guys on the podium and getting a guy on top of the podium. All right, Tony. We'll end with this. Are you the greatest showman in freestyle wrestling right now? I would say yes. Um, from a not from a a perspective of being a flashy wrestler, but I think you know from going out there and keeping my word and, you know, doing what I do best and performing and winning and keep pushing through. And, you know, even when things aren't going my way or they're not at the top, I'm going to find a way to get back on top. That was Tony Ramos. He won the U S open this year. He's going to be competing at the world team trials and then looking for a spot in final X. Thanks for taking the time, Tony. Really enjoyed this interview. Well, thank you. Great interview with Tony Ramos. We are fortunate that we have two guests on today's podcast. Up next, we have Ben Provisor. He was an Olympian in 2012 and 2016, but most recently he was a back-to-back medal winner at the Pan Am Championships. He normally wrestles in Greco, but won a gold medal at the Pan Am Championships in freestyle and a bronze in Greco-Roman. Ben, how are you? I'm doing well. How you guys doing? Hey, we're doing good because we're buzzing from your story. You got to fill us in on how this happened. Sounds like Jaden Cox <laughs> went down, and then they asked you to fill in freestyle. Take it from there. Yeah, well, I was wrestling Greco, and uh, halfway through, I lost my semifinal match. And then after the semifinal match, Cunningham, Casey came up to me, and he was like, "Hey, you might have to weigh in for freestyle." And then, you know, he at first he told me that oh, you just have to weigh in to qualify the weight for Worlds. You don't have to wrestle or anything. And then, you know, I wasn't feeling too bad after my after my matches in Greco. I had five matches, and then I was like, oh, I might as well just wrestle. And he said the same thing. I was like, well, the best way to get in shape is wrestling matches. So I just went out there and wrestled the best I could. I actually felt better in freestyle than I did in Greco because I actually I had an extra day to, to um, like get, get the travel out of me. So I felt I didn't feel like my body was responding to me in Greco, but so I was actually happy I got to wrestle again the next day and I uh, felt a little better about how I wrestled. Ben, when's the last time you wrestled a freestyle match prior to Pan Ams? Uh, I was junior Pan Ams seven years ago. So when you go out and you wrestle freestyle, are you in the Greco mentality? Were you thinking about taking any leg shots or is it all Greco? Oh. Uh, I didn't really shoot even in high school. So, <laughs> I mean, I could control a lot of matches like with just, with my hand fighting. So all I did was underhook everybody, and push them out, and then gut wrench them. I don't think I actually touched a leg. Were you surprised? I mean, you rolled through that tournament 32 to 0. that surprise you at all? Um, well, maybe it was a little bit of the quality of the opponents weren't too good. But, uh, <laughs> no, I mean – if I, I know if I'm on my game, especially wrestling a freestyler, like my hand fighting is a lot different. My underhook, if you've never felt my underhook and you're a freestyler, you're not really going to be able to defend it. It's a tough, it's a different feel. So, I mean, I'm pretty low and got good hand fighting and got a big head, so it's hard to get to my legs anyways. So I knew if I just won the hand fight, I, you know, I was going to beat most of these guys anyways, even if I did have a better opponent. 
Is that fun coming back on the plane ride, knowing you did something pretty dang cool? Yeah, it was pretty cool. I think that was the first time I've like, you know, even in all my Greco success I've had, that was the first time a lot of people were noticing me on social media and stuff and getting cool uh, shout outs. So yeah, it was it was pretty cool like doing that and gaining a little fame from it or something. So I uh, I I thought it was pretty cool. How did you catch the Greco Roman bug? I was just a kid. Um, I would all I would I never won high school state or anything, but then I would go to you know Greco national tournaments and win all of them. I just was much better at it from a young age. Dennis Hall was in my hometown, so I had, I was like lucky enough to watch him in the 2004 trials. And, you know, I've been to my mom. You know, took me everywhere to get good training, and you know that's pretty much the end of it. I, had a lot of great coaches and good mentors to get me where I'm at. When you're at the Pan American Championships, you have a chance to probably interact with the freestyle team and the Greco team. How are those guys different? How do you guys perceive the sport differently? Um, I, I think I've known a lot more of the Greco guys, you know, for a lot longer, and uh, I'm getting to know a lot of the freestylers now. Being at any lion, because a lot of guys, you know, Gwizdowski comes and trains there once in a while, and. You know, I'm getting to know David real well because he lives, you know, lives in State College, obviously, with me. So, uh, I mean, really, I don't think it differentiates more. It's just a different, you know, click. You know, the Greco guys hang out with the Greco guys. The freestyle guys hang out with the freestyle guys. Yeah, I thought it was cool to get an aspect of sort of both, you know, teams. I don't, I don't think they differ too much. They're just trying to be the best at, at their individual sport. Ben, how do you wind up? In State College with the Nittany Lion Wrestling Club, how has the first year there gone? What does your training look like there? Who's there to, to roll around with you? Well, I train mostly with, like, uh, Casey Cunningham, the Varner. I wrestle with Kale, even though he just had shoulder surgery, so he's getting back to it. But, uh, yeah, Kale will wrestle me. And then, obviously, Mason Manville was, made the world team last year. He's probably my main training partner. And I'll roll around with, you know, Bo Nickel. I'll roll around with. Cesar, uh, Vincenzo, Mark Hall, all those guys are you know, willing to come wrestle me. And they have to wrestle me and Greco in practice, so it's pretty fun. How was the first year there worked out compared to oh, what you thought awesome. maybe going I mean, in? I, yeah, I mean, I didn't really, I didn't really, I guess, come in here with any expectations. I just came in, came in here with the expectation that they were going to, you know, help me get to, you know, accomplish my goals. And I really think, you know, just in my diet, you know, the type of shape I'm in and, you know, just me doing the right things every single day to become a world Olympic champion. It's, it's hard not to do those things when you see, you know, coaches are doing the same things, you know, Varner, Cunningham, they all, they and Kale, they all work out like with us. So it's hard not to follow that example. What's it like to be a full-time athlete in a sport where you don't have set competitions like every week or every day, like in baseball, what's that like? Well, we still have set practices and stuff, so you know we're we're training year round, getting set for getting ready for tournaments. It's more, you know, being in the type of shape we need to be in all year round and being ready whenever our name's called. So uh, it's it's nice when you have a schedule, but you know, like like what I just did, you got to be able to roll with the unexpected punches. If you can't if you can't roll with those punches in in wrestling, then you know when a big match comes up, you're not going to be able to roll with unexpected punches too. So you just got to try to do your best and always be ready to compete at your best. seems like Casey, Casey Cunningham's a guy that a lot of the athletes point to as their guy, the guy that develops them. What, what is, oh, yeah. yeah, what's special about him? How does he do it? He just communicates. He, he can wrestle. I've seen him not eat all day and be in the wrestling room for eight, nine hours working out with different partners every hour. It's it's absolutely insane. And he, the crazy part about it, he beats most of our national champs that we have right now. Like, whoops their butt. He's, he's 41 years old or 40 years old and still doing that stuff. It's crazy. He's just, you know, and he's, on top of that, he's just a great person, you know. They're, like, he just sets an example for people of who you should be and how you should act. And I think a lot of our guys try to follow that. And he, I think he explains technique really well. He breaks it down. He's able to... You know, let you drill and get better when you're wrestling with him, and, and he's just all around great guy too. 
Did you agree with Matt Lindland after the U23 World Championships about what he said, how the, the Greco-Roman culture needs to change? I don't know if you caught that interview, but do you agree <clears throat> with that? Yeah, um, I, I caught the interview. I saw that he was uh, pretty fired up. I think that uh, like those things had more to do with what was going on in Colorado um, as far as the culture change and stuff like that, you know, and just – kids being young that are being successful and not doing the right things. Um, as far as me, I don't think that, uh, apply that message applied to me so much. Cause I, you know, I'm like in the prime of my career, I'm not doing all the, you know, I, I'm not being a 21 year old or 18 year old, whatever he was talking about. But, uh, you know, I think there obviously needs to be some sort of change. We need to change something to get better results. And if we don't, don't do that, you know, then we're just going to, continued on the same path of you know not creating medals and we, we've uh, not had medals for a while in this sport so we gotta try to get better you know and I, I think there's a lot of things that need to change in Greco in order for us to to be you know the best in the world and there, a lot of it comes down to funding there's a lot of people in the U.S. that struggle just to get the nationals so you know when they try to go overseas and get better they just don't really have the opportunity to do that because there's no money. We have talked a lot on this podcast about just the youth wrestling movement. Have you seen that trickle down into Greco-Roman? The guy that comes to mind for me is Kamal Bay. Uh, what has he done for the program, and what have you seen with the youth wrestling movement, movement in Greco? Well, yeah, definitely being a, being a junior world champ and you know having that like a very exciting style, I think brought a lot of interest into the sport and hopefully Kamal can continue doing those same things on the senior level and, you know, keep getting better every day. You know, I know he got hurt a little bit at the Pan Ams. Hopefully it's nothing too serious and he can bounce back. Um, but, you know, as long as you got those really good athletes and high, high, I guess like high ticket guys or, you know, big recruits coming out of high school doing well in Greco. Hopefully we can attract some other guys. And I know it's tough. It's tough to pull a lot of the really good guys from, uh, from what's it called from freestyle and folk style because there's so much, there's so much attraction to it, you know, and so much publicity on it. It's hard to, to really truly pull people from it. And you can get a college education. You can do the same thing at Northern Michigan, but, it's not like a full scholarship or anything that you can do in college. You were coached by Dennis Hall, 1995 world champion, silver medalist in 1996. I just think of Dennis Hall, I think of intensity. How does he bring that intensity and how does he exude that in practice that makes it infectious for you? Well, when I was a kid, he was still competing. So, you know, I saw the raw style, like side of him that maybe a lot of people don't see now and uh i was just lucky enough to be around him when he was competing and hopefully the you know hopefully it's still rubbing off on the guys that are uh that he's coached by and i I was just blessed to have him i mean i don't really know too many people who were born in the same hometown where an active world champion and olympic silver medalist was living so I, i really feel like i was placed around him for a reason and i just you know i'm thankful that i was do you still stay in touch with him oh i'm actually i'm heading back to wisconsin right now to do a camp with him so great yeah i definitely still he was in my corner at nationals too so yeah with uh wisconsin though a lot of a lot of things happening there just a lot of all-time greats coming out of the state of wisconsin were you aware of that growing up with Ben Peterson, Ben Askren, John Peterson, uh, list goes on and on. Lee Camp Russell for Wisconsin. Were you aware of the history at that time? Um, I don't think I was really aware when I was young, um, but I definitely have learned a lot since, you know, making making a few teams and seeing like just how good of wrestlers come out of Wisconsin. So uh, we definitely have a rich history in wrestling, and I, I think it's only going to continue. You know, we got some really good young guys going into college now, and I think uh, those are the guys that are going to carry the torch for Wisconsin in the next, I don't know, 20 years. I mean, I'll still be around for a while, so we'll see. 
Ben, between uh, 2012 when you make the Olympics and 2016 when you you do it again, you went through a, a series of injuries. How did that uh, change yeah. your perspective on the sport, and, and uh, what did you learn about yourself during that that period of time? Well, I think there was a lot of about myself. You know, I I was sort of in a in a bad training situation, I would say, and I, my relationship wasn't good. So I feel like I needed to straighten those. I feel like God was telling me that I needed to straighten those things out personally before my success in wrestling could happen you know i needed to make changes in my life and you know move different places and uh move i guess people in and out of my life and once i felt like i I started listening to god and listening to what i felt like was right um my success started falling and now the last three years have been uh, arguably i mean not even arguably the best careers the best few years of my my life and i'm just thankful to be back on the right track and hopefully i can uh continue that success for the next you know two or six years so who's been most influential on that change um i would definitely just have to say jesus really i just started listening to what i feel like he was telling me um i wouldn't say any one person was most uh, uh i guess in involved with it but it was more just me listening to my gut feeling and what I feel like God was telling me to do. And as soon as I started doing that, I feel like he's been rewarding me. And, you know, the last few year, last year, I was about to quit wrestling, you know, and I, I really was just sort of hanging on. I wasn't making enough money to, to just live. And, you know, luckily this situation with the New Line Wrestling Club came up and I was able to continue my career, you know, arguably with the best the best team in the nation. I, got, I put my career in God's hands, and then God put me in the best place he could. And I, I just believed that I was doing the right things every day, and and then it came came to fruition with joining the Indian Lion Wrestling Club. You know, I'm lucky. I'm the only Greco guy in the U.S. that's at a, you know, RTC. So it's uh, I'm just really blessed to be there. How do you feel about the rules package in Greco-Roman right now? The rules? Yeah. Oh, man, the rules are always changing. I don't know what to say about the rules. The rules have changed, what, 20 times in the last 12 years? So, I mean, I don't mind the rules right now. I think they're on a good uh, – uh, they're decent. I would rather it all stay on the feet, but that's just because in America, we don't, we're not as good in parterre as the foreigners are. You know, we got to get a better feel for the foreigners. So, I mean, we've got to wear them out before we get on the, like, go down. Um, but I, I don't think the style of an American wrestler has changed. We need to attack on our feet, and get foreigners tired, and stay ahead of them in the hand fight. Um, because positionally, I feel like they're just better than us. So, um, I'm fine with the rules. Uh, you know, hopefully this this coming Olympics is not as as rough as the last Olympics was with all the the referee calls and stuff that that's one thing that bothers me, I guess, more than the rules. You said Casey Cunningham can still kick some butt. How about Matt Lindley? Can he take you out? Take me out? Yeah. I don't know. I never said they could take me out. <laughs> they might be able to kick some butt in freestyle. Cunningham might kick my butt in freestyle. I mean, he definitely would. There's no doubt about that. Well, how, but, about, uh, how about Matt Lindley? Greco, I don't know. Matt Lindley? I mean, Matt's good, but he's got – that's got a that's got a bad hip, so oh. I don't I don't I wouldn't want to hurt him. Okay, how, how about if you you just say hey, I want to just try this? I'm just going to try to toss Robbie Smith. How would that go? That wouldn't work. <laughs> he's too big. Yeah, he's a big boy. It seems like he brings a lot of he, life. He he seems like a good guy. Is it fun being around Robbie? Yeah, definitely a great guy to be around. You know, he's a enthusiastic person. He really tries to, you know, he's all. Team USA, you a big, big, loud leader, and you know I've been lucky enough to be training with him for I don't know the last eight years almost, and we've had a got a good friendship, and hopefully you know he can continue the success. I don't know how much longer he's going to wrestle, but hopefully you know in the next few years we can both achieve our goals and bring home world and Olympic medals. 
Ben, what's what's next for you after Greco Roman wrestling's done? After your competitive career ends? Um, well, it's either going to be the WWE or the UFC. Which one are you leaning so, toward? Um, I, I honestly don't know, but leaning towards, I would say fighting because I started doing, I started like taking some boxing classes and taking like watching stuff seriously. And it was actually weird. Last year, I was just, I hung a bag at the farm that I lived at and fighting and like moving like that actually comes a little bit more naturally to me than wrestling. So do you plan to continue wrestling through 2020? Yeah, definitely through 2020. We'll see, you know, if I don't achieve my goal, I think I could wrestle definitely. So for another, another quad, but, um, I definitely want to do something different before I'm done with my athletic prime. So, It'll either be the WWE or the UFC or, you know, Bellator fighting, something like that. So you working with Jerry Briscoe with WWE? Yeah, I, I went and did a tryout, and, you know, they liked me a lot, and uh, so they offered me a contract. But um, I told them I wasn't ready to, to do that yet or to give up wrestling yet, so... All right, hey, this has been a lot of fun. Congratulations on a great storyline, picking up a championship at the Pan American Championships and, and a great story and gold medal around your neck. Congratulations on that, and thank you for joining us on our program. No worries. Thank you, man. All right, that was Ben Provisor. I'm Kyle Klingman of the National Wrestling Hall of Fame Dan Gable Museum, along with Andy Hamilton of TrackWrestling.com. You have been listening to On the Mat. This show is part of the Matt Talk Podcast Network. For more wrestling podcasts, head over to matttalkonline.com.